Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller. I'm Susie Younger. An African-American licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed therapist. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias. Anything that marginalizes and oppresses. As a white woman, I ask the questions white people are too afraid to ask. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, Susie and I will have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? We are so excited about our guest today. Dr. Yanya Lawich is a researcher, best-selling author, educator who specializes in cults and extremist groups. Professor Emerita of sociology at California State University, Chico. She's been studying controversial groups and abusive relationships for over 30 years. We are so excited to get in this. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, uh, so yeah, talk about excitement. I'm, I'm gonna try to not mess up my, my questions because there were so <laughs> many, I had to narrow them down, so. Yes. <laughs> I wanna start off by saying you are so fascinating. I mean, you, you just, you really are. And as you said, you were in a cult for 10 years. Please right. talk about the strategy used to groom and recruit cult members by the leaders. Well, you know, the leaders come up with the idea or the message or this, you know, supposedly secret path to some sort of salvation, whether it's religious or political or self-improvement, whatever. After that, once they get a few followers, the, the leaders actually don't do very much. They're kind of lazy, actually. They like to sit <laughs> back and bask in the glory, right? So it's the, it's the followers who go out and recruit and bring people in and, uh, you know, help set up the structure that keeps people in line. So, you know, recruitment is usually done um, person to person, although lately, obviously, we've seen a lot of cults uh, coming forth on the internet. Um, but still today, about 60, 66% of people are recruited by a friend, a family member, or a coworker. So of course, it's harder to say no to someone you know when they first invite you to something or show you something or want you to come see the guru lift himself off his chair or whatever it might be, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all they need to do is get you to that first thing. And then the other cult members who are there will focus on you and they'll do what we call love bombing, which is they'll kind of surround you with praise and how wonderful you are, or how beautiful you are, whatever, you know, and make you feel really loved. And like, these are such wonderful people. And and because they're so nice and kind to you, 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 you know, this is one of the principles of influence. You then feel obligated to come back when they invite you to the next thing. And you think, oh, these are such nice people. So it kind of just goes on from there. Um, and once you get in, you know, the cults will have set up a structure of um, what I call these interlocking mechanisms of influence and control to continue manipulating you and, and keep you in the group. They use a narcissist strategy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So how did you eventually get out of the cult? Well, the cult I was in, which was a political cult um, where we wanted to, you know, have a revolution and get rid of racism and sexism and classism and all these things that sounded like a wonderful thing to get rid of. Um, what happened is after after about 10 years, um, we actually had our revolution in that we overthrew our leader. Um, wow. It's a very, very unusual ending yeah. for a cult group. Um, and so what happened is the, you know, those of us who'd been in for almost the whole time, we, we were really burned out. I mean, we'd been working 18 hour days, seven days a week, year after year. Mm -hmm. And the leader was an alcoholic and abusive and domineering. And so what happened is she was out of the country at one point. And so we called everybody together and told them what was really going on behind the scenes. And of wow. course, at first they didn't believe us. They thought we were like trying to have a coup. And so it took almost a week till everybody was convinced that we were telling the truth. And then we took a vote and we voted unanimously to uh, 
expel the leader and dissolve the organization. So we all got out. That is amazing. Yeah. So there's definitely a mental health component that makes you more vulnerable than another person. And it makes you completely accessible to the recruiters of cults. How would you describe the characteristics of that? Well, I wouldn't call it a mental health component. I, I okay. would say that people get recruited at vulnerable points in their lives. And being vulnerable isn't a, isn't a mental health illness. I mean, right. we're, all, we're all vulnerable millions of times in our lives, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. We're Absolutely. vulnerable if it's raining out, if our dog yes. died, if we moved mm -hmm. to a new town, if we just graduated from school, whatever, just got divorced, whatever, right? So being vulnerable means you're, you know, you're a little bit off center maybe, and you're looking for some solace or some comfort or a framework for understanding what's going on. Okay. So it's at that point that people get, uh, often get recruited and you know, in all the years I've been doing this, I think if there's any common denominator among who gets into cults, it's idealism. It's people mm -hmm. who want a better world or want a better life for themselves and their family or want, want more money perhaps or whatever, but it's that right. idealistic urge that responds to whatever message uh, that they resonate with. Of course, the message has to resonate with you, otherwise you're not gonna yeah. you know, yeah. be interested. Yeah, it makes sense. I guess I think of vulnerability, you know, I've been most vulnerable when I've been depressed. So that's what I mean by mental health component, or when I've had a lot of anxiety in my life, not yeah. necessarily, you know, an extreme mental illness, but just exactly. like the kind of symptoms that make you more accessible have to do with where we are in life. Exactly. And so, but I, but what I like that you said that's different than my thinking is idealism. Mm -hmm. That's a new shift. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, so in your opinion, do you think there's a different approach used with, say, uh, people of color and Black people in uh, how they're recruited versus uh, the dominant Caucasian community? Is I there a cultural difference? I don't think so. I mean, not in the not in the cults that I've studied of of both types. I mean, I think we've seen fewer uh, Black or Latino cults, although certainly they exist. Um, mm -hmm we've seen, I'd say more of them are, are religious based, um, oh, which, isn't, okay. which isn't the case, you know, there's all types of cults and they right. don't, they aren't all religious, but I think because of the power of religion in the black community say, um, it's a good hunting ground for cult leaders yeah. right, to, to present that kind of message. Um, and, and probably the same with, with Latino people. Yes. Um, and, and then I think the other, the other type of um, cult we've seen in the black community are, are probably some of the uh, more radical political cults like Nation of Islam or, you know, okay. Um, okay. some of the black nationalist or, um, you know, sort of opposite of white supremacist. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. no, that may, that, I hear what you're saying. So you have said that most cults, I like this, have answers to life's biggest questions. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's genius right there. And it shapes members into believers. And that just makes so much sense. So I have a question for you. Would you consider Donald Trump a cult leader? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Can you say more about that? Yes. Well, you know, he, he it, the, the Trump cult, or I guess now we can call it the GOP cult, um, mm -hmm is a little bit different. Um, what we saw, I think, over the last four years, um, which we've never seen before, is a, a cult on a national scale. Yeah. I mean, we've never seen it before in our country. Certainly, they've seen it in Germany and in North Korea and China under Chairman Mao and things like that. Um, but Trump very much acted, and I suppose still acts, even though we haven't heard much from him lately, thank God. Um, it's still, you know, he acts like a cult leader. He, yes. um, he favors certain people. He punishes those who are disloyal. Uh, he sends, you know, praise and dog whistles to certain communities that he knows are going to respond, you know, especially the racists. Um, and he, um, you know, as a good cult leader should, he would have these rallies where he would 
show up and rile up his base and have these slogans, you know, lock her up or whatever it might be, you know, make America great again. Um, so all of these things are, are, are the same types of things that happen in cults on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think it's been a little hard for people to, to grasp just because it's more amorphous. It's not, right. you know, it's not a bunch of people living in some community somewhere or on a compound. Not that that's necessary anyway for a cult to be a cult, um, but because it's had, had such a huge scope um, but there, there's no doubt in my mind that he behaves like, you know, like a narcissistic authoritarian, which is what, what many cult leaders are. You, you know, uh, wow. it was amazing to hear some people who got arrested from January 6th say, I believe that he was going to, you know, uh, would drop charges against me or whatever language they use. And it was just like, wow, that's such cult language. Yes. It's yes. just unbelievable. Yeah. No, they absolutely, I mean, they, you know, many of them saw him as their, literally their Messiah, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then I think some of them kind of used that to push their agendas yeah. for, you know, like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys and those guys. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and, and, and there are still so many, you know, who believe, you know, he's still going to become president again. It's really a level of violence that way outdoes most other cults that I've studied. Most cults wow. actually act inward, right? Wow. They abuse their own members or they, you know, the, yes. even though they may want to save the world or the leader is megalomaniac, most of them don't really act outward. And so this is also something new that we've seen is how how the uh, vi the violent extremism has been set loose. That is amazing. So you sort of align um, abusive relationships with cults. And I want to hear more about that. Can you talk about how that reasoning or that thought process started to make sense to you? Sure. Um, well, I, you know, I think if we think about abusive relationships as a another type of psychological entrapment. Right. Um, we see that, um, you know, there's gaslighting, mm -hmm. uh, there's the, the domineering partner, there's the punishment and reward syndrome, uh, there's the, the, the lack of, the loss of self-esteem self and self-confidence in, in the one who's being abused. Uh, there's the um, belief that you can't get away or you can't leave or you have nowhere to go. I mean, there are so many similarities. Um, right. So yeah. I, I believe abusive relationships have so many of the same characteristics and people coming out of them have very similar issues to, to deal with in recovery. Not, not every abusive relationship is a cult, although some of them do become cult-like. Right. Um, and especially, I think, you know, the other thing I've talked about in, in my book, Take Back Your Life, are the family cults, um, which take on, you know, where you have a domineering family member who may or may not take on, you know, claim to have godlike qualities, but create, you know, a cult within the family. It's so interesting. So there's, there's, what is, how do cult members or how do the cults keep their members so obedient? Well, you know, it has to do with um, the indoctrination program. Mm -hmm. So the way I see it, cults put forth, a cult leader will put forth what I call a transcendent belief system, meaning that this is a belief system that offers you the answer to everything, to the past, the present and future. So it gives you a new framework for evaluating the world and your role in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So what, and part of that, the, the important part of that belief system is that you have to go through a personal transformation in order to uh, be qualified to, to be on the path, to be accepted to be on the path. Once you accept that, uh, then the changes start. And so that, that path of personal transformation, that's the indoctrination system, right? So every group will have its own type of indoctrination system, which may include classes or exercises, training programs, whatever it might be, right? 
through the indoctrination program, the cult member is being re-socialized into becoming the, the, the good, believing, loyal cult leader, cult member, I'm sorry, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and their only devotion is to the cult leader. After a time, um, and this doesn't always happen with everybody, and that's why, you know, different people in a group can have different experiences. Right. But after time, for at least some of the members, you're going to completely internalize that belief system and the demands of that belief system and the um, sort of blind loyalty to the leader. Okay. Once you've internalized everything, it doesn't really need, you don't really need someone on the outside telling you what to do. You're telling yourself what to do and you're chastising yourself if you have doubts or hesitations, right? So you're kind of, you kind of become this little microcosm of the cult, right? And wow. that's, that's what I see as um, living in what I call a bounded reality. Mm -hmm. Once you're enveloped in that clo closed social system, that self-sealing system, it's closed in on itself. Once you're in that space, then you take on, uh, again, what I call bounded choice, meaning that Yes, you'll have decisions to make. Uh, generally, they're not gonna be about anything major, but you will have decisions to make and nobody's holding a gun to your head, right? But you know exactly the decision you need to make to stay in the good graces of the group. Because at that point, not being in the group is tantamount to death. Wow. You cannot imagine life outside the group. Wow. And, you know, it's, it's so interesting. I just watched The Vow and I know you were a part of that, but the part of where the, the strategy to separate the members from their families, yes. how does that evolve? I, because as an outsider, I watch it wonder, is it, is it part of that system, the indoctrinization? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the, You'll be taught, you know, generally quite early on that uh, people who are not part of this new special elite group that you've found um, are, are going to hold you back. They're going to present barriers to your um, success on the path or whatever uh -huh. language they might use, right? So, no, you shouldn't see that friend. And they, they may not even have to tell you that, but you, you yourself understand. I know if I go see Susie Q, she's going to question me about what I'm doing and she's going to try to detract me from the path. So no, I'm going to refuse to have coffee with Susie Q. No, I'm not going to go home for Thanksgiving because I know they're just going to badger me about my dedication to this group. Wow. And of course, every group does damage control. So they're going to have you you know, trained ahead of time about what to expect when you see people outside the group. Um, so that it, it becomes part of that um, new you that's being created, that, that anybody who's not part of what, of what you're part of this now very special group is, is in a sense an enemy. I was just gonna say they become the enemy. They become the enemy, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What would you say the major difference between the older cults and the more modern day cults that we're so, seeing today? So I'm not sure what you mean by older cults. You mean well, the, like Jim the, Jones versus um, you the Val. Yeah, <laughs> or Scientology. Yeah, Scientology. Yeah, I don't talk Scientology, but okay. okay. <laughs> Nexium. <laughs> Nexium. Okay. Well, I think that. Um, you know, they're, they're very much similar. I mean, it took, you know, I mean, Jim Jones started as, as a church um, and people, you know, again, people brought in friends, things like that. Um, it, the exposés were about to happen, which is why they, he took everybody to Guyana. Um, Nexium, you know, did pretty much the same thing. They, although, you know, it was a different, um, a different demographic, a different population. He recruited, uh, you know, they recruited through their self-improvement programs that cost okay. a lot of money. Uh, they focused, you know, they focused on celebrities and the entertainment right. industry who um, typically are people who 
are, are worried about their image. And even though they may look super hot when we see them, there's a lot of self, you know, self doubt in the entertainment industry and it's very competitive. So signing on for thousand dollar classes to be better at what you do seems like a good thing. So they use these, um, these classes as kind of the route into the cult. They were kind of, they were the sort of the front group. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, centers were set up around the country where people were more involved, but to be really, really part of it, you were, you were told to move to Albany and not everybody moved to Albany. Um, and then those who moved to Albany clearly got caught up in the, in the much more extreme stuff that Keith Raniere in his sadism and psych psychopathy, um, you know, did orchestrated such horrendous things uh, on people and especially on women. Um, and so I guess it was more modern in the, in the types of recruitment that was done or the way the recruitment was done. Um, and of course now, you know, we're seeing these internet cults and, and that's really new because I, uh, before this, I always said, well, it takes personal contact to get recruited even when Heaven's Gate, which was probably the first internet cult in the late 90s, even when they recruited over the internet, people eventually came, the ones who got recruited eventually came to where they were in San Diego. But now we have this phenomenon of QAnon and these conspiracies right. and all that, where there isn't necessarily the personal contact, but they create internet com communities. And so it's through all the time they spend in their internet community, that they're getting the same degree of peer pressure that exists in the physical cults. Which is so scary. And I would imagine during this pandemic, yes. it's actually yeah. exacerbated all of this. Yes, you're absolutely right. Wow. What would you say the worst cult you've ever, <laughs> <laughs> you've ever seen? <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's really impossible to say that, you know, I mean, there, there was a cult in Canada where, where people were made to chop off their arms. I mean, there was, you know, there was Keith Raniere, who I, I do believe was one of the more horrendous uh, cult leaders and, and vicious and abusive. Um, you know, there was the cult in, in um, Colombia, the German cult, Colonia Dignidad, that tortured the children. It's almost impossible to say which is the worst wow. one. And, and you know what, what's, what's always shocking to me, you know, as you said in the intro, I've been doing this for 30 some years. Every week and almost every day, I learn of a new cult. Wow. I have people wow. contacting me, telling me about a group I had never heard of before. I know they're not making it up you know, they, there's too much detail and there's too much they're exposing. Um, and I, you know, many of them I can then research online, but it, 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 it it's, you know, I, I don't want to be one of these hysterical people who says there's a cult under every tree, mm -hmm. but good Lord, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and not just in our country, around the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Wow. What, what do you, what do you think the most important thing is you want people to know about cults? Well, I, you know, I guess if you're, if you're a potential recruit, I think the most important thing is to slow down, to not be rushed into something, uh, to do your homework and be a good consumer. Um, you know, I, I, people jump into these things, you know, w without a thought. It's right. important to trust your gut. You know, pretend you're buying a car. When you buy a car, you don't, buy the first car you see, you drive several around, you ask your friends who own that type of car, you look at consumer reports, you know, right? So do your research, don't be pushed into something quickly. If you're, if it's a um, one of these management or leadership training programs, which are super popular right now in the business world, in the corporate world, if you're being asked to sign a waiver that says you won't hold them responsible if something happens to you, run out the door, oh. don't sign the waiver. If yeah. they're asking you to sign a waiver, that probably means something's going to happen to you. Right. <laughs> right? So, right. So, you know, really, really tap into your common sense and slow down and do your research. Yeah, it and sounds it, like one of those pyramid 
scheme. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that, um, you know, and it's true right now uh, because of the pandemic. Um, you know, cults recruit very successfully when societies are in turmoil. Mm -hmm. And so clearly in the last four years, we've been in turmoil. Uh, hopefully things will calm down now. Um, but also the pandemic really put people, you know, on edge and like, you know, what the hell is going on, right? So that's when people look for some framework to help understand the world, right? To give them some sense of comfort. And so that's why people can easily then be recruited into cults. Um, historically, we saw when, when the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union broke up, tons of you know, I shouldn't say tons, it's vague, but lots of, <laughs> <laughs> lots of cults ran to the to Eastern Europe to recruit because, right, here were people, thousands of people, millions who just had their world ripped out from under them, right? Their right. whole world view. So they're, they're going to be looking for something new to believe in, right? right. So the, the pandemic is kind of like that for us and has been. And, um, and, and then the amount of time people could spend on the internet, you know, yeah. sort of falling down these rabbit holes. That makes so much sense. Um, there's so much more to ask you and to talk about, but I'm just going to have one final question, which is, what do you think we need in order to change the narrative? Well, um, <laughs> I think what, I mean, what we need so much. I know, <laughs> so a loaded question, I know. There's so much work to be done in our country, but I think we need some kind of national education program. And I know that makes me sound like an awful socialist. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> so, yeah, God forbid. But I do, I do believe we need to um, get the American public and especially young people back to critical thinking. Mm -hmm. I think we've lost our way in that. And, um, and so I, you know, I can say, you know, as someone who was a professor, I would see this on the application. I was on the uh, scholarship committee and I would see on the applications from high school the students were being pushed and pushed and pushed to do service work, do service work. Mm -hmm. Well, service work is fine. And I think service work is important. Uh -huh. But what about your grades? What about your critical thinking? What about your intellectual growth? And so I think we've kind of lost our way a little bit. And on top of that, we have, you know, this talk radio and some of these news stations that have really led to what I call the dumbing down of America. So I think we need some type of, of national education program that will bring common sense and critical thinking back to people. Um, th there's a woman who contacted me who wrote a, who's writing a series of books for children and teenagers on um, you know how to how to distinguish a healthy group from an unhealthy group. Oh, that's great. And yeah, her name is Gretchen Day. Uh, her books are on Amazon. And her, the first book she did for young kids, her children actually drew the graphics for the book. And, so and you know, I don't know that these books are perfect, but I, right. I, I was so inspired by her. And I hope other people will be inspired by her to like take on this challenge. Um, and then, of course, we need to combat hate in whatever way we can. I mean, the... Um, the rampant racism and prejudice in our country is, you know, I don't need to tell you, uh, yeah. it, it, you know, it's beyond, I think, what we've ever seen short of the slave days. Mm -hmm. And we need to be super diligent in, in, in every way possible to, to combat racism and to take down those groups um, that were emboldened by Trump. Because uh. Those were always fringe groups, right? They were right. Like, who 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 wanted to be part of that? But now, because they've 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 risen up and they had, you know, they had the blessing, so to speak, of of a political leader, of a very top leader, right? So so they don't seem so fringe anymore. They seem like a mass movement, right. and so that looks groovy. And oh, let's hook up with them. No, we need to stop that. 
So whatever ways that we can dismantle those groups and put the leaders in jail or whatever so that they become fringe again mm. and, and are not able to be as active as they've been. Um, you know, I never thought I'd see our country get to this place. And, um, you know, I try to be hopeful now that Biden is in and hope that there will be some positive changes and people will kind of settle down. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, I agree. Yanya, I, all I can say is please agree to come back. Yes. Because I'd love to come back. I mean, there is so much more to dig into here. And your mind is an amazing place to be. I'm just like feel myself on the edge of the sea. I know. <laughs> You're really you. amazing. Really. Thank you. Thank and you, thank you so, so much you for and out. invited me. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm so glad you, you responded. So <laughs> glad you responded. Take care and I'll be in touch, okay? All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Have a good Bye. day. Bye.